Okay, so good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Ajit Johnson, and uh, I'll be talking about SciMap, uh, which is essentially a package to kind of uh, do image analysis. So we are essentially going to go through this part of uh, this part of the uh, you know this chart here. Uh, before we get to this part, there's actually a lot of work that goes prior to um, uh, the image analysis pipeline. So there is a pipeline called MC Micro Pipeline, which is being developed at LSP as well, which takes the raw images that are acquired from the uh, microscope and spits out you know a single cell data, and then. Uh, beyond this is what SciMap is used for, is essentially to do a variety of data analysis. So it could include everything from QC, clustering and phenotyping the cells, uh, and then marker expression analysis. Say you have identified, by phenotyping, you have identified two different populations of tumor cells or something like that. And then based on uh, some of the pathway markers that you had included in your uh, assay, you can look at is this pathway activated in this subgroup of you know tumor cells, or is this or uh, is there cell cycling going on in uh, another subgroup of tumor cells and so on. So, and obviously with uh, any of the um, you know spatial data, with size of uh, data, what we get is the uh, spatial location of uh, each of the cell, and spatial analysis is a huge component in um, uh, uh, in the data analysis of uh, uh, of size of data. And finally, we have visualization. It's not just visualizing you know, the image itself, but also how can we visualize the you know, several kind of data analysis that you have done here, like looking at proportions of cells uh, or regional differences. How can we visualize those things um, you know, and share it with others in the form of a manuscript or something like that? Um, so what I've done is I've taken all of this and literally uh, uh, grouped them into four different categories for the uh, package itself. Um, so the package comes with four different modules. Um, all the pre-processing steps are under the .pp module. Uh, and then we have the tools module, plotting module, and some helper functions, which, uh, you know, uh, which doesn't necessarily fit in any of these categories. Right, so the single data essentially looks like this. Uh, what you have is a counts table, uh, very similar to the sequencing world. Um, you have cells in your x-axis, so you'll have probably say uh, 1 million cells in a single site. So you have 1 million rows, and then you have all your different markers that you strain for. Um, and then you have the metadata file, which is, uh, for, uh, which is essentially everything that's uh, data that's related to your single cell. So for example, uh, cell one here has the X coordinate of this and Y coordinate of this. That's give, that gives the spatial you know, um, uh, resolution for all the cells here. And you know, with, if you're using MC Micro, you also get many of these other features like what's the area of the cell, uh, what's the major axis length, minor axis length, and you have a bunch of bunch more other features that comes with, uh, you know, the MC Micro pipeline. Right. So, how do we store this data in Python? So we have, say, for now you have two spreadsheets uh, or uh, Excel sheets where you have counts table and your metadata file. Uh, and the now, now the question is, how do we store this within uh, Python? What you could do is you could just import them as two data frames and start working on that. And say you identified phenotypes for a few, uh, for some of the cells, and that would become another data frame. And say you subsetted some of the cells for some subsequent analysis, that would become another data frame. So every time you do kind of a computation analysis on your, uh, on your data set, what happens is you're creating more and more data frames or more and more files. And it's really hard to manage uh, all of those together. And what you would end up doing is it's saving all of them into a folder. And the next time um, you, you start the analysis, you're probably essentially starting from scratch, uh, kind of redoing many of those processes again. Um, and so I think this was a common problem for a long time. And uh, a long time back, uh, 
within the R world, they came up with this uh, data structure called expression set. Uh, and recently in the Python world also, they have kind of uh, uh, imported that kind of uh, object orientation to store your data in a meaningful way. So this is a very simple, um, you know, um, uh, conceptually it's very simple. All you do is uh, you store different parts of your data into these four different buckets. So for example, you have your accounts table, which is stored within this data matrix, um, which can be accessed by this dot X. And then you have all your metadata, which is stored within this bucket, which can be uh, accessed by your dot OBS. And then you have all your variables, essentially your gene names uh, and uh, anything that's associated with the gene name. Say you had uh, staying the same antibody twice and you want to see how well they correlate with each other, you can group them into categories. So this is group one, this is group two, and then you know, in your data analysis, you can very easily subset them into two and see how well they correlate each other. So all your variables here, all your metadata here, um, and your accounts matrix here. And finally, you have something called the unstructured. So uh, essentially what doesn't fit here goes into this bucket of unstructured. Uh, so the way I think about this is like a big Excel sheet where you have different you know, sheets. Uh, you have your matrix sheet, you have your metadata sheet, uh, you have your variable sheet, and you have other additional sheets which doesn't fit into any of this category, and you just pass on these sheets to others. So for example, you say that you did some kind of analysis, now you save that into an object file and you can you know, immediately pass this object file to someone else and they don't have to repeat any of the analysis you did because everything is, go, uh, everything is going to be saved within the object itself. So they can literally start off from where you left. Uh, so that's another nice feature. And you have the link here, you can obviously go and look at that. They have a lot more documentation on how this works. It essentially probably takes you like, you know, a couple of days to get used to this uh, object structure, but it's absolutely worth getting to know it. And this is kind of very well used in the single cell sequencing field. And as I said, that uh, one of the main advantages of using uh, this uh, uh, data structure is that you can use some of the other, you know, packages that has been already built uh, for doing single cell RNA sequencing analysis. So you can import some of those uh, you know, functions and tools and readily work with this data rather than having to rewrite or you know, scramble between different packages and um, uh, trying to do the data analysis. Right, so how do we um, uh, create the data object? It's very simple. All you do is like two lines of command and you would be ready to go with the data object. So some of the packages, so andata.ad is the package which creates the um, uh, uh, data object itself. Um, and then basically you import these packages, set your working directory, and then load your accounts table into, your, uh, into the uh, data object, load your metadata into your metadata object, and then uh, just initialize uh, the and data object on the data, and then essentially you're saying, uh, put the metadata into uh, the uh, adata.obs a uh, structure. That's pretty much it. That's how you get started with it. So it's very straightforward, and we can literally now go back to, you know, uh, uh, the pi file that I shared, and if you can uh, start a uh, Jupyter version, uh, Jupyter notebook, and we can actually go through that right now. Do you have any questions? Ajit, are we just opening up SciMap Tutorial.py with the Jupyter notebook, or you want to make a new notebook and copy stuff into it? Either way, you could just make a new notebook and copy, you know, some of each of these. Uh, Things and just run it. All right. So essentially, what you what you might have got is your a data object. So if you um, simply type a data, you will know what is within that. So a data is the short form of annotated data. You can name it whatever you want. But essentially, what it says that you have four thousand eight hundred cells and forty eight different uh, markers. All right. And within your OBS, which is our metadata, you have the X and Y coordinates, 
you have multiple other things like area as as we saw earlier uh, you have other metadata associated with it as well so now if you run adata.obs it essentially prints out your uh, metadata if you uh, run adata.x it will uh, print out your counts table so uh, it's stored as a numpy array so that's the reason you look see uh, it comes out like this and then if you print out adata.var um, then it would print out all your uh, gene names or marker names right so these are the three main uh, categories um, and then as i said uh, so you would have noticed that all the DNA channels are there, like DNA1, DNA2, and so on and so forth. So now if you start doing any kind of data analysis on this, it's all the DNA channels are going to be included, all your background channels are going to be included, and you might already know that some of your uh, you know, uh, staining did not work, those kind of things would be included as well. So, And if you start doing any kind of clusterings and things like that, all of this can actually affect your uh, results. Uh, so one way is to go and start deleting these things from your data frame and clearing all of those up. But for at least for everyone in this call, I think most of us would be getting our, uh, you know, uh, our uh, output from MC Micro. So there is a helper function which actually takes the MC Micro output and converts that into a uh, and data object. Uh, so now if you run this. So uh, within that folder, I have included a file called mcmicrooutput.csv, which is a typical output that you get out of um, uh, mcmicro. So what you did need to do is to run, uh, pass it uh, through this function called mcmicro to scimap. Um, let me just go here and show you what options are available. So this is the function mcmicro to scimap. Uh, and it has a number of parameters within which you can uh, use. The most important one is the image path, which is passed as a list. Uh, and you can include one image or one CSV file or multiple CSV files into this. So if you're like working with the TMA or something, you might have you know, multiple um, CSV files associated with say a particular disease. So you can pass all your, um, uh, uh, CSV files into this, or if you're working with just one image, that's also fine. Just pass that one image into this uh, parameter and it should work. So by default, it would remove all the DNA channels. So if you do not want to remove the DNA channels, just set it as false. Uh, false. Um, and, then, and then you can log the data directly. So you can just say log equals true, uh, equals true and then it would log the data and it would uh, and that log data would be stored within a data.x. Um, and then you can also drop markers. So for example, if you know that some of the markers do not work, or if there are like a lot of background markers in this uh, data set that we are working with. So you can just pass that again as a list, and that would mar uh, drop all those unwanted markers from your final um, and data. And then say that you just for example, you're working with a large um, uh, image and you just want to subsample uh, some data and start, you know, to get just an initial idea of what the data is like. You don't want to process the entire data set. You just want to, want to you know, subsample a bit of the data. You can just give a random number here. So it randomly some sample, say if you get thousand cells here, it'll just subsample thousand cells within your data and you're not loading the entire data set. Um, so the cell ID column, so this is by default, it's set to cell ID. So if, if with any SciMap output, you'd see that the first column is cell ID, uh, which is essentially a unique uh, number given to each single cell. Uh, the reason I use this is what I do is I automatically generate uh, image ID. Uh, this is important because if you're importing multiple images into, your, uh, into a single data frame, you want to keep track of where that cells came from, right? So if cells one to thousand might have come from one image, cells thousand to two thousand might have come from two, uh, second image. So you want to keep track of where those uh, cells came from. So I, if there is, uh, uh, so I automatically create an image ID and 
uh, based on the name of the CSV file. So for example, if you had given like, you know, something blah, blah, blah dot, um, you know, uh, sitemap tutorial dot CSV, what it'll do is it'll use that sitemap uh, tutorial as the image ID. And if you're passing in like multiple images, whatever the name of this uh, um, uh, um, CSV file, it's considered as an image ID. But you can also pa uh, pass in your own uh, user-defined image ID as well if you want. So it will take that and concatenate with the cell ID and create a unique cell ID uh, so that every single cell in your data set has a unique ID. And again, these are only necessary when you're like having multiple image, when you're loading multiple images into a single uh, and data object. And then split equals uh, X centroid. It's, it's not X position anymore. It's X centroid because MC Micro had recently a, a update and they have changed the name to uh, X centroid now. So essentially it needs to do, what MC Micro outputs is a big CSV file, which includes both your counts data and your metadata into one CSV file. So we need to split that into two. So that split position is where exactly where your metadata starts and your uh, counts data ends. So that's, that's the column name where you're splitting your data from and that's what you need. But you don't have to worry about any of these things because these are kind of default uh, uh, parameter within the function itself. Um, um, so yeah, but if if you if you if you're using something else like you know data from uh, Codex or something like that, then you might want to modify these to fit that uh, uh, data type. And finally, you have one more uh, parameter called minimum cells. Again, this is only useful if you're using. Uh, multiple, uh, if you're loading multiple images into one uh, and data object. So for example, I've seen that in some TMAs, most of the cells would be lost. It, like probably 100 or 200 cells would be left in a TMA. And I don't want to include that in my analysis because I want uh, TMAs which has like, you know, which has maintained and maintained integrity over the cycle. So like at least 1000 or 2000 cells. So I can pass in a number saying that, you know, if, if, the, if, if an image has less than 1,000 cells, then discard that image. So in your final AND data object, those kind of TMA would not be included. And when you run this, you would, it will actually print out um, um, the images that it had in, uh, excluded from uh, the AND data object. So that's kind of um, uh, the MC Micro 2 SIMAP function. As I said, all you need is the image path and everything else is kind of default and it would run. So now you can run this. Uh, image path is the path to the MC micro output.csv. And here what I've done is I've given them the image path and I'm dropping these different markers. So background markers uh, and NOS2, I know that it did not work in this data set. Uh, PERC, I know that it did not work in this uh, data set. And Actin, I'm not gonna use it in any of my further analysis. So um, I'm gonna drop all these markers from my, uh, you know, uh, while creating the and data object. I guess everyone has run it. Yeah, so again, as previously, if you type a data x, dot x, you will uh, see your data frame, but now you would see that they are all log transformed. As I said previously, by default, it's true. But if you want your raw data, it will be saved under adata.raw.x. So your raw data is still there, it's not lost. So whenever you want your raw data, you can always go back and get that. And then as usual, if you type adata.obs, it will print out all your uh, metadata file. But if you actually go all the way to the right, you'd, you'd see that it has included a new column, which was not originally in your data set which is essentially the uh, name of your uh, CSV file. In this case, it was mcmicro underscore output, so it has included that as a column. And if you had multiple images, if you had loaded multiple images, obviously uh, this would change according to the image you are looking at. Right, so, and then now you can start exploring the data, right? So since, as I said that, uh, and data object is also used by ScanPy. So ScanPy is generally used in the 
uh, RNA sequencing world. And now you can actually use many of the functions that they have developed to run directly on this, uh, on this object to kind of start exploring the data. So the first function here is essentially look at um, genes that are highly expressed. So the way that, it, that it's calculated is what is the proportion of this particular marker uh, within an individual cell, right? So for a given cell, this is the, uh, you know, um, uh, this is the uh, proportion or, or the ranking of proportions of markers that's defined. So for any given cell, MHC1 is, seems to be the highest expressing marker, then CD56, CD45, and so on. The reason I do this is to just initially get an idea. So I know that CD56 marks NK cells, and NK cells are rare in this data set. And given that it's high up here, already says that this, this marker has a very high background. Um, and I would potentially drop this marker from further analysis or be very careful while doing further data analysis. MHC1 is kind of marks all the nucleated cells, so that's expected. So any cell that you look at should have MHC1. So that being up here doesn't surprise me. And most of the cells in this data set is uh, CD45 positive. Most of them are immune cells. And that being up here also doesn't um, you know, surprise me. And again, most of the cells in this data set are B cells and CD20 being up here, again, doesn't surprise me. So that kind of, kind of gives me uh, you know, a sense of what's the distribution of the different markers and what kind of markers would I trust and not trust in further analysis. Um, the next you could potentially do is do a PCA analysis to look at you know, what's the most varying uh, thing within your data set. So ScanPy again has a PCA function. Um, just run uh, this first line here, which would actually perform the PCA. And then you could uh, project your PCA on a, uh, on a dot plot and color the dots based on, uh, on, a, on a particular marker. So that's what is, uh, what's shown here. So I've run the PCA and I'm projecting uh, and I'm coloring based on KI67, which is a cell cycle marker. And all this tells me is that within the PCA space, there's at least, you know, there's, uh, there is some cells that are, um, uh, that are proliferating. And then you can also look at what's the variance or what, what are the loadings, what PCs are contributing most to your, uh, uh, most to your you know, PC analysis. And this essentially ranks your PC based on, uh, based on the uh, uh, variance or the contribution. And you can see that, and I've seen this in most of SciSIP data, mostly the first 10 PCs are kind of the most contributing feature uh, or the variance within your data set. So this gives you an idea of kind of you know uh, how many PCs could you should be looking at, and then finally you can save your you know whatever you've done so far. You can all you need to do is adata dot write and save it as a H five AD file. And as I said pre earlier, this is really nice because once your analysis is done, it's done. You don't have to run any of these uh, steps again, like. You don't have to calculate any of this. It's calculated and it's stored within your AND data and you can simply run the plotting functions. For example, you don't have to calculate your PCA. You can just plot your PCA because it's already been drawn and it has been stored within your AND data object. Uh, running a PCA does, uh, won't seem to be you know, uh, a hard thing, but like when you come to like UMAP and stuff, which takes a really long time to run, it really makes sense because the UMAP, you, all, all you have to do is run your UMAP once and you can keep plotting it again and again. You can close your stuff, you can come back to it, uh, plot it again and things like that. So uh, it saves a, lo a lot of time when it comes to that point. Yeah, so that's about it for like, you know, just getting an overview of your data. Uh, the next main thing is actually phenotyping your cells. One of, the pro one of the main approaches that's usually taken in the single cell field is take your data uh, and then project that as a network um, 
and then visualize it using some UMAP or something and cluster the network uh, and then look what those clusters, uh, those clusters of cells represent. Uh, it makes very good sense in single cell space because you have a lot of uh, dimensions. So you have like um, probably every single cell expresses at least like 3,000, 4,000 different genes. So you have, uh, you know, you have a lot of dimensions to work with and that gives power in your cluster analysis. So when you project that on a UMAP space, you would usually in single cell, on a sequencing data, you what you would see is this nice tight clusters forming, which usually represents or generally represents a cell type. But that doesn't necessarily, you know, uh, happen with sizeive data. One of the reasons is that you have low dimensions because you have you're probably working with like 30 markers or 40 ma markers uh, max at a time. Uh, so the number of dimensions is low. And the second thing is. There's a lot of technical artifacts that comes out with uh, sizeive data. For example, uh, you know, background fluorescence or autofluorescence. We just saw that CD56, even though should be expressed only in a small number of cells, uh, is probably you know is the highest expressing gene in every single cell. So that itself is a con confounding factor. Uh, the other thing is segmentation errors. So um, when there's a cell, when you're not able to segment two cells, uh, exactly what happens is there's a leakage of, uh, you know, information from one cell to another. For example, a cell, a T cell should ideally express only CD3. Uh, but you would also see that uh, due to segmentation errors, they might be expressing CD20. Uh, and what happens is that this, in fact, confuses the, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, higher dimensional data and CD3 and CD20 cells starts clustering together, which is in reality, it, it should not happen because these are two different cell types. Uh, but because of the segmentation errors, they start clustering together. And this kind of, you know, uh, undermines your uh, clustering approach because when you're clustering this, it will say that this whole population is a single cell, a single type of cell. In fact, it could be two different types of cells, uh, cell types within there. So these are some things that you need to be aware of, but anyway, this is one of the common approaches that's used uh, and we will go through it. Uh, uh, but just be, uh, you know, as we go through it, I'll probably point out more things uh, to be aware of some of these limitations. Right, so the first thing you need to do with any kind of uh, clustering analysis is that you need to create, uh, generate a neighborhood graph. Uh, so with size, uh, with uh, sorry, uh, with ScanPy, you have this nice function called neighborhoods, uh, neighbors, and you just pass in your AND data and the number of neighbors that you would like, and I mean, uh, and the number of pieces. Uh, I generally do uh, pass in the number of pieces, but it's not mandatory. Uh, so once you run that, it will calculate the uh, neighbors for every single cell. Essentially, it's trying to identify similar kind of cells um, uh, among the entire data set. So ideally, all the T cells would kind of be close together in the neighborhood graph. All the B cells should be close together in the neighborhood graph and so on. And then you can visualize the uh, neighborhood graph using UMAP. So you just run this command. Um, um, again, from ScanPy, you map of your AND data. Uh, so as I said, when you run your neighborhood, it actually, behind the scenes, it actually um, saves your neighborhood graph within, the, within your AND data object itself. And that's why you're directly able to run the UMAP on it. And it, it knows that where the neighborhood you know, graph is saved. So it's gonna uh, look for the neighborhood graph uh, and then run UMAP on that. If you run this command before running the neighborhood, uh, you know, analysis, it'll, you know, basically throw an error and say that, you know, you need to run the neighborhood graph before running a new UMAP, right? So if you run a UMAP, it's going to run it on the neighborhood uh, graph, and then you can visualize the um, uh, UMAP and color it based on different markers of interest. Um, Again, so this is a pretty small data set. You have only 4,000 genes, so it will be very, very quick. But for example, if you're working with a million cells, this is going to take a really, really long time. 
so what I would suggest is that, you know, subsample your data for about like, you know, 100,000 cells or something like that, uh, and then run the UMAP on that and visualize the UMAP on that. Um, so you could run uh, up until this point, uh, probably I'll wait for a couple of minutes. Uh, let me know if you, once you have, you know, uh, once you have got this plot and I can go over this plot again. Right so have everyone got this plot here? Simon, yes. Yuan, yes. John, yes. Roxy, yes, probably. Okay. Um, right, so if you start looking closely, Right, so once you have this plot, the way uh, in a single cell sequencing field, how they interpret this plot is that, okay, I'm probably thinking that this is a, probably a cell type and there's going to be multiple cell types within this, right? And right away, you can start to see problems here. One is CD20. So CD20 is a marker for B cells. CD3D, 3D is a marker for T cells. And there is a cluster here which has both CD20 and CD3 expression. In reality, that should not be the case, right? We know that CD3D positive cells do not express CD20, and this and the vice versa is true as well. CD20 positive cells do not express CD3D. So there's something going on here. It could be that it could be that it's because of segmentation errors. This I know that this data set is enriched with B cells. So if you have a lot of B cells and you know T cells in between that, uh, the, the segmentation errors can uh, you know, bring about saying that T cells are expressing CD20. But there's nothing that we can do in this step, right? If you cluster this, it's probably going to capture this as one, uh, one kind of cluster. Uh, and if, if it doesn't capture this structure as a different cluster, there's almost nothing you can do about it. Uh, so you're almost relying on your clustering algorithm to somehow, hopefully, you know, set the resolution to really high so that it forms small, small, small clusters and then you can assemble them into a bigger cluster. The second thing is, uh, the thing that you might want to notice is that there's no clear boundary. For example, you can see that there's CD3 expression here. There's high expression here. These are probably T cell, but what about these cells here, right? So there's no clear boundary for separation between one cell type on, uh, to another cell type. So again, when you're clustering this, you need to be really careful because the cells are the boundaries of any of these clusters could be false positives, right? Could be false, essentially, um, you could be calling a different cell type as something else. So be very careful about that. Right, so this next step here runs the clustering algorithm. There are several different types of clustering algorithm. I'm using Leiden clustering, which is kind of the most uh, latest version of clustering algorithm that is used in the single cell field. But there's a lot of other clustering uh, methods like, so there's Lovane clustering, there is a density-based clustering like, you know, uh, what's that? Uh, DB, uh, DB map, then you have k-means clustering, which is really fast, but it might not be able to capture some of these higher dimensional structures, but you have a lot of options here. Uh, you can use whatever you're most comfortable with, and it also kind of depends on your size of your data set as well. So if you have a small data set, any of these clustering approaches would, uh, would be fine, but when you have a really large data set, you need to be careful because some of these can take forever to run. And this resolution parameter, at least for latent clustering, is what I talked about. You can change this resolution parameter so that you either get you know, a lot of clusters or small, uh, a low number of clusters. So by default, it's one. And I'm just gonna stick with the default now. If you run the clustering, and now again, color the UMAP based on you know, some of the genes and the cluster itself. So I ran latent clustering, and so I'm gonna add latent clustering as the color here. And you can see that these are the clusters that the clustering has uh, identified. So again, in this bit here, as we saw, 
there is subset of cells which are probably CD3 D positive, or it could be error. We still don't know what is the reality, but um, it's not capturing the structure here, right? So it's capturing something else. Um, and you need to be careful while evaluating this, whether this is the real structure or if this is the real structure. So make sure that you look at all the markers and you get an idea of what, what's the pattern of expression uh, of the markers that you're uh, interested in and all the cell types that you're interested in and see that your latent clustering or any clustering that you're using actually captures that structure. Um, the alternative is to start changing your resolution parameters so that you know you form smaller and smaller clusters and then you can start assembling some of those clusters into uh, mega clusters. Uh, but again, as I said earlier, if it doesn't capture the structure that you can visually see, then there's no way around it. You have to go with some other clustering algorithm or then it just gets too manual to you know actually using any of these higher dimensional approaches. Right, so the other nice feature that's uh, available within your ScanPy package is that once you've clustered your data, you can actually start looking at what are the most you know what is the uh, what is the marker that defines those structure uh, those clusters right so essentially you're running a t test there's a lot of other uh, options available within the scan package as well so you can just uh, go to the documentation and look for this function they have a lot more other methods so here i'm running a t test but there's like log regression method there's uh, you know other statistical tests uh, there's a word method there's so many other methods so uh, use whatever test is more most appropriate to your data set. So here all I'm saying is that, you know, I'm passing in my and data object and the column to look at. So which is the column that I want to, uh, you know, run this test on. So the latent clustering. So it's going to look at uh, all the clusters and, and make a plot like this. So Cluster zero versus the rest, cluster one versus the rest, cluster two versus the rest, and it will give you what's the gene that's most you know, expressed or uh, what's the gene that's most differentially expressed in that cluster. And you can see that probably cluster one, cluster two, and cluster seven here are probably T cells because they, are, they have you know, CD3 right at the top. So cluster one is probably this. Cluster, sorry, cluster one, two, so one and two. So these are probably T cells that make sense that fits with this criteria here. Um, and then we have cluster seven as well. Uh, cluster seven is this bit here, right? So it's basically suggesting that this entire bit is T cells, right? And you can still see that there's some CD3D expression here, uh, and that doesn't fall particularly into a specific cluster but then it falls into this red here probably three uh, and this violet here four so if you look at three it's mostly cd21 and cd20 again b cell related and what is this violet cd cluster four again cd21 and cd20 again b cell related so we still don't know what this population of cells are they might be T cells, they might be B cells. Uh, just looking through these plots, I'm guessing that they are B cells and this is just a segmentation error, right? Um, in which case it's good because you have captured all the T cells and these are all B cells. But if they turn out, if this population turns out to be uh, in fact T cells, then we are screwed. Uh, because then you're misclassifying these uh, cells of cells which are partly T cells to be B cells, right? So, uh, right, so have everyone run up until this point? I'll probably give you a few minutes so that you can run it and make sure that it works on your hand as well. All right, so I wrote something here. Let me just quickly read this. Yeah, so I said like, it looks like cluster one, two, and seven could be combined into a T cell cluster, just as I said. Uh, and the boundaries are not clear. Uh, yeah, so, uh, and it becomes increasingly complex once you want to do deeper phenotyping. Say, for example, you want to identify 
CD4 helper T cells or CD8 T cells or regulatory T cells and so on. So this itself is very hard. I mean, even in like bird's eye view, identifying T cells itself has been a little bit difficult. Uh, and now subdividing these T cells into smaller clusters is going to be even more difficult, right? And then look, if you look at the marker analysis, it shows that CD30 is most expressed in cluster eight. So you can see that cluster eight, it ex mostly expresses CD30. And I know for a fact that CD30 is not expressed in any of the cells in this data set. Uh, so just going by this, you would be you would be wrongly assigning some of the categories into you know some cell types which they are not. So be careful of that as well. Right. So that brings me to a probability distribution based phenotyping. Right. So this is a method that I developed, and that's also. Uh, uh, incorporated into the uh, package. So this is, in my perspective, it's a little bit more labor intensive. Uh, intensive. However, it's like significantly more sensitive and much more scalable than clustering based approaches. So, um, so the labor intensive part is to identify which cells are positive or negative for a particular marker, right? So once you've identified that, running this takes less than five minutes on on your data set like if you if you if you have like even two million cells in your data set it will take less than five minutes if you have a million cells and you're running umap and clustering on that that's also going to take a long long time so either way if you have large data set it's going to take a long time uh I'm just saying that this approach is more labor intensive because you have to sit there and figure out for every single marker which cells are positive or which cells are negative uh, for that marker of interest, right? So in order for this method to work, you kind of need two different things. I'll just go back to my presentation here. Um, right, so the probability distribution-based algorithm involves three steps, right? The first step is to identify the gates. So I have a function there called gate finder to identify the gates. Uh, and then once you have identified the gates, gates for the markers, you basically rescale your data based on the gates you have identified. And for rescaling your data, you use this function called rescale. And once you have rescaled the data, you can phenotype the cells based on, uh, uh, based on a prior knowledge based approach. I'll show you what that prior knowledge based approach is, but essentially these are the three functions you'll be using to phenotype the cells based on this probability distribution based approach. Again, you need to identify the gates, rescale the data, and then phenotype your cells. Right, so the first function is gate finder, right? So the gate finder, what it does, this is where Napari comes into play. You're essentially looking at the image yourself and making sure for any given gate, these, are the, these cells are positive or negative. We'll get to, get to that, but I'll just give you a brief uh, you know, idea on what the function itself uh, takes in. So the function takes in an image path. So this is the path to your OME TIFF file. Uh, so this is the actual image, not the data set. And then you have your A data, and then you have your markers of interest. Um, so the marker of interest is the, mark, is the marker that you're gating on. So for example, if you want to gate, uh, you know, CD3 cell, uh, CD3, uh, CD3D, right? So CD3D marks T cells. And if you want to uh, identify what's the cells that are positive for CD3D, that is what you pass in here. So it takes in just one marker at a time. So essentially you say, you need to do this for every single marker. So like you run CD3D first, CD20 uh, 20 next, and so on and so forth. And then what's the from, from gate to gate and in, uh, increments? So if you think about gating, uh, I'm not sure if everyone are aware of gating, maybe this plot would help. So imagine this is the distribution of a particular marker, right? For example, CD3D. Uh, gating is essentially, you're setting a threshold somewhere along this line, along this distribution, saying that anything to the right of this distribution are considered positive cells, and anything to the left of this distribution are considered negative cells. And the y-axis here is the log expression of your uh, marker of interest, right? So 
for CD3D say that any, any cell that expresses more than seven of uh, log expression of seven is considered as positive cells and anything that expresses less than seven are considered as negative cells. So that is what you're trying to do. So you can say that I want to check all the gates between six and eight with an increment of one. What it essentially does, it, it calculates you know, the cells that are positive uh, if your gate was six, the cells that are positive if your gate was 6.1, 6.2, 6.3, and so on and so forth, all the way up to you know, 7.9 and eight. So that's what from gate to gate and increment does. So I generally set it to, by default it's six to eight, I generally say five to nine uh, with an increment of 0 0.1 and just you know, print everything because this doesn't take a long time. Um, all right, so this parameter here, marker. So marker of interest and markers are different. So marker of interest is the marker that you're gating and marker markers is essentially additional channels that you want to load in your image. So for small data sets like this, it doesn't matter. You can just specify none and it'll load all the uh, markers in your data set on the image. But if you have like large data sets, like really big images, then if you do this, your computer is gonna crash. So you might want to include only few markers at a time. Like for example, I just add the markers that are necessary. Like if I'm doing CD3 here, which is which marks CD, uh, which marks T cells, then I, then I include some you know, additional markers like CD20 or CD31 or something, which is like, which I know should not be expressed by CD3 positive cells. Uh, so basically uh, orthogonal you know, markers which might help you to distinguish between cell types. So uh, can be added into this um, in a parameter here. Uh, all right, channel names you don't have to worry about because once when you, initi when you initialize your AND data object using the you know, MC micro to SIMAP function, what I also do is I uh, save all the channel names uh, into, a, into the unstructured uh, you know, compartment there. Uh, the reason being, for example, when you loaded your packet, uh, when you loaded your AND data object, you might have left a few um, you know, uh, channels like the background channel, the DNA channel, and then a few channels that you thought that might, was not interesting. But when you load the image itself, it needs to know all the channels, right? Uh, when you load the image, it's going to load all the different channels in your, uh, in your actual image. So it needs to know what all the different channels are. And that's the reason I use this, uh, use this bit. So when you're initializing your AND data, uh, AND data with, the, uh, with the SIMAP uh, function, it actually saves all your original um, you know, um, uh, markers into uh, into a um, you know uh, the compartment that I talked about, and the, and this bit is essentially going to look at that uh, region and ident uh, and map them back to the image. In case you do not load your um, uh, load your you know uh, data using the SIMAP function, then you need to pass in all the different markers uh, into this uh, into this parameter here. But other than that, you have your X and Y coordinates, which is by default is X centroid and Y centroid. Point size is, as you know that, it basically puts a point on your image. Uh, you can change the point size here. And image ID is again uh, essential when, when you have multiple images on your uh, data set. You need to pass in the image ID, the new column that I talked about, uh, the exact ID, uh, ID for, the, for the image that you're looking at because it doesn't know if you're looking at x and y coordinates, it's going to look at all x and y coordinates, and so it needs to subset you know, the actual image that you're looking at. Uh, and if you have segmentation mask, you can put that, uh, you can pass that uh, as well into uh, into this parameter here. But ideally, all you would need to do is image path is necessary, uh, a data is there, marker of interest, and uh, you know these markers are kind of the most important things that you need to pass. Right, so if we come back here, now you can actually start running this. Maybe I'll just run this from mine once so that you get an idea of what it looks like and then 
you can run it by yourself. Right, so run this bit here. Um, this essentially is make sure that your you know your backend is that Qt five P. And then I'm gonna say this is my image path. So the TIFF file within the folder that I shared um, and the marker of interest, I'm gonna get CD45. And then I'm gonna run this command. So image path is then, E data is E data, marker of interest is CD45. I'm gonna say get everything between five, nine with an increment of 0 0.1. And I'm also going to include alpha SMA and DNA11. Uh, so alpha SMA and CD45 should be uh, expressed in mutually exclusive cells. They should not overlap. So that gives me you know, a point to start with and also DNA channel because it's always nice to have DNA there. So if I run this, it spins out an Apari uh, instance. Okay, so this is what I, I, I mean, for those who have not used Apari, uh, just a quick overview. This is your image viewing panel. These are your different layers. So if you have multiple, like, um, you know, cell, uh, uh, multiple channels, you can have that here. And these are the kind of points that I just calculated within the function. So for example, what are the positive cells with a gate of five? So, right, with a gate of five, which is a very low gate, it's saying that almost all cells are positive for that, uh, for CD45. And you know what's uh, what are the positive cells with the gate of eight point six and so on. So this helps you to determine the gate. Um, and then, so this is the marker itself, CD forty five. So you are you are in fact looking at the actual image right now. And you can and this bit here lets you to you know change the contrast. You can make sure that the background is not as much, and then you know increase the contrast and show. Um, so on, and then you can also change the color of what it want you want it to be like red or you know they have a bit of colors here. You can choose whatever you want. So these are the CD45 positive cells in my core. I'm going to also switch on alpha SMA, right? So as you can see, that alpha SMA should not be expressed on CD45. These are essentially here marking blood vessels. And you can see that alpha SMA is here. I cannot see that clearly, so I'm just gonna change that to red or something so that I can see it more clearly, right? And I can increase the contrast so that it's more clear. So generally, the way I identify a particular gate, so if you want, you can also switch on DNA. Uh, it's up to your interest. But now what I do is I zoom in to areas where I know that cells should be mutually exclusive. Right, so these are alpha SMA positive cells, these are CD5 positive cells. Most of the errors can come from, uh, you know, these boundaries uh, where a cell is being misclassified. So this is where you need to be very careful while setting your gate. So I'm gonna set, you know, five, and it's gonna like literally put a dot on everything, right? So it's, it's you can see that alpha SMA positive cells are also being called as CD45 positive cells, which is not real. So I'm gonna go up here, say 8.6, right? So now very few cells are only this bright region here uh, of CD45 cells are being picked up as CD45 positive. So that is also not true. All right, so I'm gonna, gonna keep going down like this and make sure I, I find a point when where all the CD5 positive cells are marked, but the you know cells that are not CD45 should not be marked. So that's the objective. So I'm gonna keep going down. There are still more CD45 positive cells. I'm gonna keep going down, down, down. Maybe still okay. Still okay. Still okay. Okay, so now you can begin to see that, so at least in this region, it's begin, beginning to mark like, you know, um, alpha SMA positive cells or CD45. So this is where I'll be a little bit more careful, right? 
and I'll, I'll usually like switch on and switch off channel. So this is probably not true. So this is probably not the right channel. So 7.2 is not the right channel. So I've narrowed down to like 7.3, 7.4 or 7.5 is probably the right gator set. And also you should, you need to be aware that it's possible not to get, you know, uh, you know the exact uh, uh, gate, uh, which might not happen because I've not overlaid the segmentation map here. So if I overlay the segmentation map, it might be that some of this cell is being missegmented in a way that, you know, there's no way you can set a gate to remove this cell from here. So that's something you need to be aware of. But also the probability method when you like do the actual phenotyping takes some of these you know uh, things into consideration while uh, while doing the uh, phenotyping itself. So you don't have to be like exactly right, but as close as you can get is always nice. So you can see that like right. So if I remove 7.3, you can see that it's removing this dot here, which is probably right. And you can also see that in this bit here, which is like entirely dark, right? So entirely dark, it's adding a dot there. So I'll remove that gate. So probably 7.4 or 7.5 is what I would settle on, right? So that's that looks more about right to me. So yeah. I would say yeah. that you know, 7.4 is a gate. And what I would do is I'll uh, create an Excel sheet let me just open that section sheet for you where I've already made the gates. Okay, while that's opening. And you might, I mean, if you actually start looking at these images, you'll realize that uh, I'm not included CD20 here. Or maybe let me just include CD20 as well. So CD3D marks T cells and CD20 marks B cells, right? So if I look at CD, uh, sorry, CD20 and CD3D. So that's CD3 positive cells and CD20 is B cells. And in areas you'll be able to see that, let me see if I can find it, but you'll be able to see that there are uh, regions where uh, the cells are literally overlapping each other, right? So you have a T cell on the bottom and a B cell on top, and there's no way you can deconvolve that, right? So you cannot expect, you know, 100% uh, right answer in this, because it's just what, it's, it's exactly what you have captured. So you can see that there is an overlap of green and red here. Let me just see them. Right, so. Right, so this cell ends here. So this cell, this is the cell here. This is the cell here. And if you look at CD3D here, this, it's partially in fact on top of the bottom cell there. So when you segment this, you are going to get a, a part of that uh, signal into each of your, you know, T cell is going to have some CD20 and this B cell is going to have some CD3D. So, and you'll have multiple, and you, if you just go through this, you'll see multiple examples. So you can see another one here. Um, and, and so there's no way of completely deconvolving uh, some of these, um, you know, artifacts. Uh, and what you're literally trying to do here is with the probability approach, say if there is an overlap, uh, such as here, you can see that there's an overlap here. You're trying to identify what cell is on top. So you're assuming that in this cell here, most of the cell, most of the signal is CD3, but some signal is from CD20. So I'm gonna assume that this cell is a CD3 positive cell. While this cell here has most of the, uh, has the highest signal from CD20, but less signal from CD3. And so I'm gonna assume that based on a probability approach, you're gonna assume that this is a B cell and so on and so forth. So that's kind of what you are trying to get at. 
but with regards to the uh, gate itself, so this is what I usually do. I just take a Excel sheet. I say, you know, these are my markers that I'm interested in. And these are the gates by just going through that plot. So as I said, we did uh, CD45, right? So CD45, I'm going to set a gate of 7.3. Uh, and you basically do that for all the markers that, are, that you're going to use for genotyping. Um, right okay so that's that's how you do the gating you can actually go on you can try it on yourself probably play around for a couple of minutes before we go to the next step all right so Anyway, we'll just quickly go through the next bit so that we can always go back and play around with this later. So once you have, once you have, um, you know, identified gates for all your different markers, or at least for the markers that you're planning to use for phenotyping, uh, the next step is to rescale your data, right? So this is a function that's used for rescaling. Again, you pass in your and data object. So gate is where you pass in your manual gates, All right? So the CSV file can be passed on here. You can also do none. None means you're not passing in a, a gate. What the algorithm would do is it would try to fit two Gaussians uh, to try and interpret, identify you know, your uh, negative population from your positive population. Again, if you want to be really, really sure that what you're calling is correct, then I would still suggest you do manual gating. Uh, but you can still, I mean, if, or if you have like a really good data set where you, you had done high resolution imaging, where the boundaries are really crisp, and you have done like, you know, using um, uh, something like Elastic or something to um, uh, uh, do the, uh, segmentation where you are literally visually made sure that the segmentation is right, then you could still go for the, you know, uh, you can just go for the automated way of gating. Uh, I've seen that, especially with like my uh, data that's been generated in like Incel or something, the data is really crisp and you do start seeing like bimodal distribution. And once you start seeing bimodal distribution, these kind of Gaussian mixture models work really well on that. And the auto gating works really well on those kind of data. Uh, but if you have like, you know, if you have a distribution like this, it's not gonna work really well. So in this case, you can see that the auto gating has identified this to be the gate. It has figured out that this to be one peak and this to be the negative peak and this has the positive peak and this to be the gate. But by manual gating, we actually found something like 6.5 or something to be the real gate. So you can already see that this is like way off, All right? So make sure that if your if you, if your distribution is like nice and bimodal and you can see it by eye, then it the Gaussian mixture modeling might be working correct and it might be identifying the uh, correct um, uh, you know uh, negative and positive population. Again, in this case as well, um, uh, by manual gating, I found that the um, uh, the uh, gate is around 6.5, uh, but the gate that the automated way has found was, you can see that it's 6.3 or something. So it has identified this bit of uh, the difference in the cells without, within this region to be uh, essentially false positive cells. So you need to be aware of that. But this is all you need, passing the gate, manual gates, uh, and you can also uh, uh, pass in failed markers here. For example, if you know that certain markers did not work, especially like CD56 that we saw in this case, uh, you can pass in you know those list of markers here. What would essentially what the algorithm would essentially do is that it's going to set a it's going to manually set a threshold right at the end of the distribution, so all the cells are negative for that particular marker. Uh, it's probably generally useful in some cases. For example, if you if you want that marker in to be in your data set but not influence your phenotyping, uh, you can take advantage of this parameter. 
and then you have another, something else called uh, method equals all. Um, so this is again only useful when you have uh, when you have multiple images. So what it essentially does is uh, it, it doesn't necessarily apply to manual gating. So when you're doing manual gating, it's gonna like literally take that as the center and rescale your data, you know, left and right to that. Uh, but if you have multiple images, all it's doing is, do you want to take the entirety of your data and then fit the two Gaussians on the entirety of your data? Or if you, do you want to uh, fit two Gaussians on every individual image in your data set? So again, this is only useful when you have multiple images stored into a single and data object. So if you uh, if 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 this is not all, I think uh, if you look at the documentation, there will be another feature. I think it's independent or something. If you put that in there, it's going to look for your image ID column, and then it's going to subset all your uh, different images into independent uh, images, and then it's going to fit two Gaussians within that data to identify your you know positive and negative cells per image. Yeah, but you can now you can go back to your this thing and just run this bit here. Essentially, you're loading your uh, manual gates and running the rescaling. That should take probably just a couple of seconds. But what you will see here is that you can see that we have only did manual gating for these markers down here. So these are the markers that I'm essentially using for phenotyping. And so the, those are the markers that we have identified or I have identified manual gates. And it's gonna scale that data based on that manual gate. And for the rest of the markers in the data set, it's gonna identify an optimal gate based on the uh, Gaussian mixture model that I just talked about. Uh, so I'm not too much worried about this because I'm not using this for phenotyping. But if you, if, if you imagine that you're gonna be using any of these markers for like subsequent analysis, so for example, if you're gonna say, if you're gonna say, I'm gonna identify the proliferating B cells. So I've identified phenotypes, but now I, I want to identify K67 positive B cells, then I would also include K67 in your you know, manual gate. But once you run the gate, you can um, look at the results. So if you do a data.x, you will see that the scale data is now available within your a data.x. Your uh, log data has been replaced by your scale data. So if you want to, you know, if you want the log data back, you basically have the raw data within your a data.raw.x. So you can just do, you know, np.log1p on your raw data to get your log data back. But ideally, at this point, your uh, your you know um, log data has been replaced by a scale data. You just need to be aware of that fact. So don't run um, uh, don't run UMAP on this. Uh, I mean, you can run, but um, it depends on your preference. So uh, make sure if you want to run UMAP on your raw data, then make sure that you replace this again with your you know. Uh, log normalized raw data to before running UMAP or things like that. Right, so once you have uh, uh, run the rescaling, now we, have, now we are going to actually phenotype the cells. So this is a little bit, uh, it, it might take a little bit to understand, but we are in the third step, that's the last step. So we have done, uh, we have identified the gates, we have rescaled the data, the final step is to phenotype the cells. So this is where the prior knowledge comes into play. So you need to create an Excel sheet like this. So you need to create a CSV file like this. So the way to interpret this plot is ha the, I have a lot of different markers here, which I'm going to use for my phenotyping. Then I have two columns here. The first column is the cells that I'm going to look at uh, and the cells that I'm going to assign them to be. So, for if you have done facts, you might remember that you know uh, you're identifying CD45 positive cells, and within CD5 positive cells, you're going to say these are CD3 positive cells, so they are probably you know T cells. These are CD20 positive cells. These are B cells, and so on. So this is very similar to that. So it it goes in a hierarchical manner, right? So you have all your cells. So I'm going to take all my cells first, 
and then assign them and then identify immune cells and alpha SMA positive cells. So take all my cells and identify these two subpopulations of cells. For all the immune cells, I'm gonna look for all the CD45 positive cells are going to be immune cells uh, and alpha SMA positive cells are going to be uh, you know, alpha SMA positive cells. And then I can take the immune cells again from there, uh, put them in the left column here, immune cells, immune cells, and then within that, I'm gonna identify T cells, B cells, myeloid lineage, NK cells, and granulocytes, and so on. So T cells, they're positive for CD3. B cells, they're positive for uh, CD20. Myeloid lineage, they can be positive for you know, CD163 or 206 or 68 or 11B or 11C. Any of, any, if any of these markers are positive, then I'm gonna assign them as myeloid cells. So you can see that I've used positive here and any positive here. So the algorithm itself takes six um, you know, uh, parameters into account. You can say you can use positive, negative, any positive, any negative, all positive, all negative. So positive means you know, if you're using uh, one or more markers, you can just use positive. Uh, negative means, you know, again, like uh, you can say that, you know, um, uh, immune cells should be CD45 positive and um, CD alpha is the main negative. So you can all, in fact, include negative there, but it doesn't matter because these two competes with each other anyway. But these are the different categories that you can use. Any positive essentially means that if any of these uh, markers are positive, what the algorithm it would do is it will take the highest, uh, you know, the one with the highest probability or the one with the highest expression to do the competition. Um, so the, what I mean by competition is that when you when you're subsetting immune cells, uh, this is where the probability comes comes into play. Uh, when you're subsetting immune cells, it, it's going to look at the expression of CD3D, CD20, you know, all of these different markers, and it's going to compete with each other to identify which is most likely that's uh, going to be. As I showed in the, as I showed previously in that image, when you have like a T cell and B cell next to each other, like overlapping a little bit, it's going to look for okay, this cell has high amount of uh, uh, CD3 but low amount of CD20, so this and this cell is going to compete with each other and it's going to say, okay, I'm going to assign this cell to be a T cell. And it's the same way with all the other different things. So, and on alternatively, the other B cell is going to compete with T cell because it has more B cell related markers. It's going to be assigned as B cell rather than a T cell. Um, right. It can have any positive, any negative. So all positive, all negative means in some cases, uh, you want all the different markers to be positive. For example, say that um, you had regulatory T cells or something like that. You would say that, you know what, I want this to be uh, CD4 positive, CD3 positive, and FOXP3 positive or something. So all of the different markers should be positive, and only then it will be assigned a you know, particular value. So th those are kind of the... Uh, parameters that you need to keep in mind, but I can always help with this whenever you have doubt. Um, and this takes a little bit of, uh, you know, fingering around to kind of get used to it. But once you get used to it, it's very easy. And you can keep using this again and again in whatever uh, context that you're using. Right, so coming back to this, uh, now you can load your phenotype, that phenotype workflow that I just showed is in that folder as well and then just run this command here uh, to do the actual phenotyping. Uh, sorry, I'll just show one more thing. So the phenotyping command itself takes in, you know, your AND data, uh, phenotype takes in the uh, phenotype workflow CSV file, and you can label the column that you want to store your phenotyping in. So in this case, I'm gonna label it as, uh, you know, phenotype. But you can imagine that you, change some of the parameters or change some of that you know, Excel, uh, CSV file, and then you want to run it again. So you can run it again. You can either overwrite the uh, old phenotyping or you can just rename this to something new and then it will be saved as well. So that, uh, you know, uh, and your subsequent versions can be saved in multiple new columns. Uh, again, this is, um, uh, 
Right. So I have two more functions within that. So it's called phenotyping threshold percentage and phenotyping threshold absolute. It essentially means that if you have like really small populations of cells, right? So uh, if you have like one or two cells being, uh, you know, annotated as say granular sites or something like that, it's likely that it's just a false positive. Um, and if you want to just remove them, you can set a threshold here saying that if any cell type is less than two cells or five cells or 10 cells, just put them, you know, as unknown or something like that, uncategorized or something like that. So uh, you don't have these false positives. I've seen that this comes, uh, comes about sometimes. And so that's the reason I included these two things. Anyway, so you can run these two commands now and you should be able to something like, you should get something like this. You know, so what this essentially does is, as you can see that uh, it takes all the cells and then phenotypes them into immune cells and alpha FMA cells, and then it's subsetting the immune cells and then phenotyping these different cell types and then subsetting the myeloid cells and phenotyping into these cells, subsetting the T cells, and then again, phenotyping them into subcategories of T cells and so on. So again, this is very fast, even if you have like, you know, more than a million cells, it'll take probably less two or three minutes to run. And then you can just run this command next to that to see, you know, what's the distribution of the uh, cell types that are phenotypes. So most of the cells in this data set is B cells, then you have you know, CD4 T cells and blah, blah, blah. And as I said earlier, like you have, you can see that there's a CD25 positive, there's one CD25 positive dendritic cell. I'm pretty sure that's wrong. Uh, so I'll probably set a threshold like you know, 10 or something to remove all of this into a category called unknown. But also be careful because previously um, there, there have been situations when I had like said that put 1% of the, any, you know, less than 1% of the cell into an unknown category. I found that there were regulatory T cells, which was less than 1%, which went into unknown. So that's a real uh, scenario. So just be aware of that. Right. So. Once you have performed phenotyping, you can now, in fact, uh, run the image viewer once again and overlay the phenotype. So in this case, so this function here essentially pulls up that, uh, you know, um, uh, Napari once again, and then overlays your phenotype and uh, you can make sure whether those phenotypes are real or not. I'll just, you know, run it once so that you can see it. And you can play around with this later on. So for example, say, I'm gonna look at, um, alpha SMA, I'm just looking for alpha SMA. Right, so these are, this is my alpha SMA within the data set. Let me just switch on. Right, so these are the alpha SMA positive cells. Uh, I can make sure I'm just gonna look at alpha SMA positive cells. And those are the cells that has, it has identified as alpha SMA positive cells. Right, same thing you can do with like CD4 T cells and uh, all the different things. Uh, these are the other T cells. These are the uh, B cells, you know, and you can overlay with the coloring and make sure they are right. It will be nice if Napari starts including a search feature here rather than me trying to find where CD20 is. Were you worried? To, were you able to change, to change the color of the dots? Uh, yeah, so by default, um, so here I'm saying point color equals white. Right. So if you don't include anything, what it would do is for every phenotype, 
So within mm -hmm. the function, uh, what I've done is for every phenotype, it would uh, pick a random color okay. uh, and put that on top. But I've, I've realized that white is the best way to visualize things. So I just uh, put white always and I just switch okay. on off the channels rather than looking through stuff. Okay. Um, all right. And you remember that we had done laden clustering previously. You can actually visualize the laden clustering as well. So this is just an image viewer, right? So this function is just an image viewer. You can put whatever column you want and um, view that. So these are the CD3 positive cells. If you remember, I think we said it was cluster seven, three, and two, which were T cells. Yeah, one, two, and seven uh, were T cells, right? Yeah, one, two, and seven were T cells. So we can actually visualize that and make sure that is correct. So one, two, and seven. Right, so you can see that it has missed a lot of T cells here. Um, so that's what I said that you need to be careful when you uh, do clustering. Um, it has captured all the T cells in this region or mostly, but it has missed all the T cells within this uh, germinal center. So that's something that you need to be careful about. Uh, right. Okay, so other things to visualize your data to make sense of your stuff. So now we have phenotyped the cells. You can run this you know, matrix plot again from ScanPy uh, to look at the expression of your uh, individual markers in the cells that you have phenotyped them to be. So for example, if you look at FOXP3, FOXP3 is expressed only in regulatory T cells and it's not expressed anywhere else. That makes sense. Uh, similarly, you can kind of go through this and make sure you know uh, all of your what you have identified uh, to be true uh, identified uh, is correct. For example, B cells here express CD45. Yes, uh, some of I, they also express K, K67. These are germinal centers, so they are proliferating B cells, uh, and then they express CD20. Yes, so that's very good. So you can go through this and make sure that's correct, and then. Now you can uh, now you can compare your you know latent clustering and the uh, manual phenotyping that you just did. So I'm 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 just uh, pulling the UMAP again because we have already run UMAP. We don't have to run it again. You're just coloring based on latent clustering and the phenotype uh, coloring that we just did, and you can immediately see that there's a lot of differences between these two. Right. So the clustering is very different. You can see that. These are B cells being clustered into two different regions here. Um, and these are in fact different cell type. And when I look closely into this, the, these seem to be uh, follicular helper T cells. So these are follicular helper T cells. Uh, yeah, there you go. So follicular helper T cells right there. Uh, so they, they are indeed T cells. They are not an artifact. They are not B cells. These are, um, uh, uh, T cells that are near two follicles which express PD1, and that's why they are called uh, follicular helper T cells. Um, so, just reiterating the fact that if you are naively run this analysis, you would have you would have missed you know uh, follicular helper T cells. So be aware of that fact, and you can see that there's a lot of overlap between these regions. Here you can see like very distinct clusters. In reality, it's not the case since you have done kind of manual gating and you looked at the images, you can already see that this green population here, I'm not sure what that would be, CD4 T cells. Okay. Um, so this region is entirely T cell related. So CD4 T cells, CD8 T cells, there's this corner is regulatory T cells and so on. Um, but this kind of structure is not captured within this and you need to be aware of that fact. And Right. Essentially, this is again to you know uh, show that they are uh, indeed follicular helper T cells that we might have missed if you are doing you know a regular clustering. You can see that they are CD3 positive cells. They are PD1 positive cells, 
And you do see that they are CD20 positive. Uh, that's probably because of the gating issue. And once you did a manual gating, you were able to take care of this you know, artifact and you were able to get this follicular helper T cell. If you had not done the uh, uh, manual gating, essentially these all clusters together and you get a false positive. Right, so again, you can load the image viewer to make sure they are indeed follicular helper T cells. Um, and finally save the results. That's pretty much it.